Hey, Don, how you doing? I'm good. How's everybody? Hi, Patrick. Hey, how you doing? I'm good. And Kimberly, how are you? Hi, good morning. Doing well. Thanks. I have a very fun and informative session today. Um, where do I see how many people we have so far? We can see we 91. 91. There we go. Okay. Yeah. We'll, we'll wow. give it a couple of minutes to get people to log on and then we'll start. Here we go. The first panel went very well. We had some good conversation. So I love it because I learn so much when I'm when I'm on these. So um, I'm looking to learn today from all of you too. And everybody's here, right? Yes. Okay. Guys, give me a heads up on when you think it's okay for me to start. I want—I don't want to waste too much time. <clears throat> okay. So we did ninety-nine. Yeah. So whenever you're ready, I think we're good. You think we're good? Okay, great. All right, everybody, welcome to the second breakout section. This is on understanding your options. Uh, my name is Dawn Lawler, and it's my honor and privilege to be your moderator today. So at this session, we're going to discuss different dialysis modalities that are available, including in-center, home hemo, nocturnal, and peritoneal dialysis. We're going to compare and contrast um, and learn the experience of the patients that have been on these different modalities. So we have a wonderful and knowledgeable panel with us here today. Um, first, I am Dawn Lawler. I'm privileged to work as a kidney care options coordinator at U.S. Renal Care. Mm -hmm. um, options education empowers patients to take control of their well-being, manage and slow the progression of kidney disease, and improve quality of life and choose the best possible treatment option. Um, I'm also an ESRD patient. I currently have a transplant. Um, I was transplanted first in 2000 and then went on after a rejection to in-center. Um, I was then transplanted for a second time in 2007 and happy to report that I'm doing well. Um, I've worked as an RN in-center and on both home modalities taught PD and HHD. So we're also honored to have here with us today, Dr. Graham Abra. He is a clinical assistant professor of nephology at Stanford University and also chief medical officer, home therapies at Satellite Healthcare Wellbound. They're a leading national not-for-profit kidney care company in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, he has deep experience in the management um, of Satellite's national home programs, where he plays a leading role oh. in helping more CKD patients live their best life on dialysis. Welcome, Dr. Abra. Thank you so much, Don. Wonderful and glad to be here. <clears throat> right. Next we have and want to welcome Kimberly Davis. She is an RN. She's the Director of Home Dialysis Therapies at the Rogerson Institute in New York. Uh, she's a medical expert in dialysis care, which we all need. And she's committed to providing patients with access to home options as well as mentoring nurses um, and to have a mission and a purpose. She provides expertise in helping people achieve excellence in their health, wellness, and business goals. Thanks, Kim, for being here today. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here today. This is going to be a great session. Also with us today is Quentin Gee. Is that the right pronunciation, Quentin? It's Quentin Turner G. Thank you. He's from Richmond, Virginia. Um, he's an in-center dialysis patient. He has focal segmental glomerular sclerosis, which derives from APOL1, which is a genetic mutation. He's passionate about patients' rights and mental health. He's a father, a husband, and an advocate for the next generation. Um, I'm really, really uh, interested in hearing your perspective today as you know, generations to come. This is who we're we're trying to get to and trying to help. Absolutely. And our final uh, contributor today is Patrick. It's a PhD. 
He is a former PD and in-center patient, currently transplanted. Um, Patrick founded the I Advocate Inc., uh, which is a faith-based um, health and wellness organization. Through I Advocate, he focuses on helping underserved, undervalued, and disenfranchised communities voice their concerns about health disparities, injustices, and lack of quality resources in the chronic disease community. Thank you so much, Patrick, for being here with us today. Thank you for having me. And uh, looking forward, just want everybody to know they're getting double for the trouble because uh, that young fella uh, is my son. So we go. I'm looking forward to oh. that. Definitely glad to share this platform with him. And we appreciate having both of you here. And we uh, are looking to learn a lot from both of you um, as your very, very valuable contributors. Um, so um, everybody can see there's a chat there. So anyone has any questions, please feel free uh, to place them in the chat. And then I will do my best um, with IT communication here to get those questions out to our panelists, okay? So I just wanted to say as a patient and a dialysis nurse, um, I've seen firsthand how important it is for you to understand what your options are. Um, you want to make dialysis fit into your life instead of making your life all about dialysis. Okay. So without further ado, we're going to get to the panelists and some questions. So um, I'm going to throw this out to um, Dr. Abra first. And I'm going to ask, um, in your experiences, um, what are the major differences between in-center and home dialysis? Yeah, it's, a, it's a great question, Don, and, and a really important one. Um, I, I think it's important to remember that the different dialysis modalities, th there is no perfect one. There's trade-offs between all of them, pluses and minuses. And as we, as we talk about those pluses and minuses, it's important for people to think about how these fit with their lives. Because for some people, the pluses are gonna outweigh the minuses for say, in-center hemodialysis. And for others, uh, it's gonna be peritoneal dialysis or home hemodialysis, or perhaps it's a preemptive transplant or conservative management without dialysis. Uh, so. It, I think that's an important framing for us as we talk about the different modalities. Um, when we think about in-center hemodialysis, uh, this is a modality where you go to the center to receive hemodialysis treatments, the blood-based dialysis, and typically patients go to the centers approximately three times per week, though there are some who go more frequently or less frequently, depending on a variety of factors. In the in-center setting, um, the care of the dialysis is provided by expert staff who are there at the dialysis center, technicians and nurses primarily, but also supported by a fantastic interdisciplinary care team, which includes registered dietitians, so social workers, administrative professionals, biomedical personnel. Um, and uh, those personnel provide uh, care to the patient uh, during their time that they're on the hemodialysis and they help with their care uh, intermittently in between through coordination efforts. The home-based modalities, those are ones where the patient, perhaps family or friends, support the patient to actually perform dialysis at home. And the dialysis care team, which is very similar to the care team that's in center, trains and empowers the patient to do their dialysis at home during a period of time that varies between say two and six weeks depending on whether we're talking about peritoneal dialysis which might take about two weeks to learn to home hemodialysis which might vary somewhere between two to six weeks depending on a variety of factors again and once the patient and uh, their care team are trained, then they go home and they perform their dialysis on their own. And then they come to the home dialysis center intermittently throughout the month to meet with the care team, meet with their nephrologist, perhaps pick up supplies, drop off labs, these types of things. But they have to go to the center much, much less frequently. So I don't want to take up too much time, but that's sort of a basic overview of the difference between uh, in-center and the home modalities. Okay. We do have a question from the chat from Joe Ellen Knight. So I'm going to get to this. Hopefully Patrick and Quentin can answer this. How long have you been on dialysis and how long in center versus home? 
Well, I've been on dialysis for two and a half years, and I've been in center the entire time. Um, I know for my previous experience, I was on peritoneal dialysis for four years, and um, I had short bouts of doing in-center hemodialysis, uh, maybe, I want to say, a total of six to seven months. Okay, so um, when you left uh, peritoneal dialysis, Patrick, why did you leave PD and go in-center? Um, actually... Uh, that's an interesting story. Uh, so in January 2015, um, they thought that I had peritonitis. So I was um, admitted to the hospital for about five days and it didn't clear up. So they removed my PD catheter, but later found out some days later that my gallbladder had exploded. So after doing the surgery to remove the gallbladder, I had to heal. So that's um, when um, they did a chest catheter and I did um, in-center hemodialysis for about 90 days. This was the first time. Um, and I went back to PD. The second time is when I had to have an operation for a hernia. So again, that was another 90 days that I had to wait and heal. So it was just two separate bouts, but the bulk of the time um, I did peritoneal dialysis. Peritoneal. And you did well on it, I'm assuming. Yes, yes yeah. ma'am. So you had good quality of life and you were able to do what you wanted to as far as your schedule and um, your work. Yes. Um, now, there were some challenges. Uh, my, first of all, it, it well, I have to thank my wife for her flexibility and patience because the prescription that my nephrologist put me on um, had me dialyzing a total of uh, um, probably about 11 and a half hours per day, which means that my bedroom literally became a warehouse because on average I would have no less than about 85 cases of um, of dialysate fluid. Wow. And that is a long treatment, 11 hours, right? Dr. Abra, that's, it's usually, isn't it usually around nine or so? I think we lost Dr. Abra. He's on. I can, I can answer typically for, um, yeah. So with peritoneal dialysis, you know, it's the way your body functions, the size of your body that determines your prescription. So, um, you know, when you switch off to using nighttime cyclers, sometimes those treatments are between, can be between nine and 11 hours. Right. Yeah, and then yeah. you can yeah. also have a fill during the day, correct? To give you correct. the 24 seven dialysis. Okay. Right. And that's what happened with me based on my um, prescription, um, which they consider to be high dose therapy. I actually did two midday exchanges. Um, my okay. first one was at 10 a.m. The second one was at 3 p.m. And then I dialyzed um, the remainder of that at night. Okay. And how, how did that affect you, Patrick, when you went to just running the cycler at night to having to add those exchanges during the day? Because I know I do have some patients, you know, say and are, are concerned with the fact that, you know, the treatments are longer than going you know, in center and just running for three and four hours, three days a week. Um, how, how, how did you feel about that? And could you tell us some, a little bit about that? Um, initially, it was disheartening because um, they couldn't, like for the first year and a half that I was on PD, they couldn't get the prescription straight. And it ended up that even though I was doing all of this dialysis, I could not make adequacy, which was really confusing to right. me. So it literally took them a year and a half to realize that they couldn't get my weight right or the, the number of how much dialysis um, I was supposed to do. And interestingly, um, when I got my transplant, um, the transplant surgeon was like, you know, he asked me, um, 
how long did I dialyze? And he said, well, you do know that there are uh, circumstances where you can dialyze too much. And he thought that this may have been, um, you know, one of the cases for me. Um, so it, it was very disheartening. And especially, um, you know, in my advocacy, still trying to go to conferences and travel, um, you know, I would always have a trunk or even the back seat full of just dialysis equipment, you know, right. going from state to state, you know, still trying to advocate. And so, I, I really, I really appreciate Patrick's perspective on this. And I think it actually highlights an important shift in how we think about, in particular, the peritoneal dialysis prescription. So uh, without, you know, delving into the specific details of Patrick's area, but it, but it highlights a, a general concept. In 2020, the International Society of Peritoneal Dialysis advocated and put forth guidelines uh, stating that we should really uh, try to achieve what's called high quality patient centered uh, dialysis. And in, in that, that means that we shouldn't focus so much on the number, the adequacy number, what's called the, the, uh, the, the weekly, the total weekly KT over V. It's a technical term, but sometimes in the past we focused too much on that. And we didn't focus enough on all the different components of how people are thriving and doing well on PD. You know, uh, is their blood pressure well controlled? Are they eating well? Are they doing the things in their life that they need to do? That they have their energy to exercise and interact with friends and family, et cetera. And we, it, they really, the ISPD really advocates for us to look at all these different components. And if that number is a little bit low, perhaps not pay quite so much attention to it as we did in the past and instead focus on right. the overall status of the patient and not right. push as as patrick says too much dialysis if it's right. going to add how do i feel do i feel okay right. exactly yeah exactly right quentin what what made you go to in center um so right off the bat at the hospital um they didn't really give me a choice on my modality it was straight into uh, hemodialysis, and um, I don't know. It was just something about having nurses and doctors there on hand uh, that made me more comfortable. They, I, I just, you know, I went through all my options. I spoke to my father. I spoke to other advocates, um, and I spoke to my nephrologist about nocturnal and and home hemo and PD and everything like that. It's just in my situation and in, in everybody's situation is different. That's why all these different modalities are good because you have a modality that is good for each person's individual circumstances. So in my Excellent point. Excellent. I live in an apartment and I live on the third floor in an apartment building. So PD wouldn't be ideal for me just because that's a lot for me to lug up and down. I actually have somebody who lives in my apartment building who is actually on PD dialysis. They live on the fifth floor, but when they get their shipment delivered for you know the dialysis and everything like that, they drop it off at the bottom floor and not at their apartment. Okay. So th there's one issue is the accessibility to I don't trust myself to insert needles into my body. Mm -hmm. And I'm not a big fan of abdominal surgery. So when they presented me with the option of PD and they also discussed transplant, I felt like if I were to go PD and then work, be on PD and work towards a transplant, that's two abdominal surgeries that I'll have. And I just can remember seeing my dad in the hospital after his multiple surgeries, and that's just something that I, I was afraid of. You know, it, it it put a fear in me that there's a possibility that that could happen to me too. And I saw how he fought to come back from that. And you know, sometimes people are strong enough to do that. Like my dad's strong enough; he was strong enough to do that. I don't think that I would have been strong enough to do that that would have took a, a real toll on my mental dialysis period it takes a toll on your mental health right and so right. having 
people there that I see day in, day out, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, five and a half hours a day. Um, I get to spend that time with those people. We laugh, we joke. They're basically a part of my family. They know my daughter, you know, so it's like I'm more comfortable doing that than I am being in my own home, providing my own care. Even with the care team, it's just I see them every day. If something goes wrong, if my, you know, blood flow rate is too high and my pressures are too high, then, you know, they can adjust that on hand. If I feel nauseous and I can't explain why, they'll come and they'll investigate and determine the issue and they'll resolve the issue. Um, right. There's a lot of steps to hemodialysis and even sometimes techs and nurses make mistakes. So if they can make a mistake, what says that I won't make a mistake? And when you have a, a fistula or a catheter, it's essentially your lifeline. And if one thing happens to that that shouldn't happen, that's it. You got to go through another surgery. You got to go to the access center. And that takes more time away from your daily life. That, that adds more expenses to you if you don't have proper insurance. Mm -hmm. So I just felt like uh, in-center was my, my best chance at uh, long-term survival for myself. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Quentin. And that's why the options are so important. Like you said, so many different types. So you can choose what you feel comfortable with. Mm -hmm. um, Patrick, I have a pay, uh, question for you from the chat asking, after your PD prescription didn't work, did anyone offer you to do home hemo? Um, mm -hmm. Well, actually, just like Quentin, I was... Uh, there were only two modalities for me to choose. That was PD or in center. Um, and basically my nephrologist kind of influenced my decision. Um, so to answer your question, um, no, that was never. So it wasn't, it wasn't an option for you. Well, it, well, it, it was an option, but it was never offered. And I will explain why. When I was given the option to pick between PD and um, in center hemodialysis, I was taken across the street from my center to an in center hemodialysis facility. Uh, within the first five minutes, I stood there crying. It was cold. In a in a matter of five minutes there were at least six patients that were being rolled out by paramedics. I mean, I actually, I thought this was like a parking lot for paramedics when I got in there. Um, it felt lifeless. Nobody was smiling. I mean, it was just one of the most grueling feelings um, ever. So I was like, no, I can't do that. And the second thing, um, that influenced my decision was uh, a number of mentors and peers. Um, and this is based on a cultural uh, decision. A number of peers and folks that I consider mentors um, had told me some of the challenges they experienced um, being racially profiled with a fistula because um, in the DMV, um, especially if you're African American, um, a lot of people, um, such as law enforcement, when they see your vascular access, think you are an intravenous drug user. So you can call it vanity or personal safety. But after um, those two things, I really came back, did my research, attended um, um, a dialysis education class and my uh, nephrologist, you know, they apologize for the prescription error, but they just convinced me, hey, this is working out for you so far. Just, just stay right here. And that's what I did. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I mean, the perspectives of Dr. G and, uh, and Quentin are just, they're incredible. And yeah. I think so important because they really do highlight 
how individual each person's experience are and how it how important it is for you know those who are attending this session and for all of us on the panel here to make sure that we educate ourselves we understand these different modalities we understand logistically what the options are because the 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 details of of what your life happens to be and what it's going to work with you know those are those are incredibly personal so it, it really yeah, i think right. both of their experiences really highlight the importance of the empowerment of the patient the education of the patient and the you know the tight relationship and the importance of finding a care team that supports you and your decisions whatever they may be uh, uh, as you go through the journey of, of uh, you know, taking care of your kidney disease. Yeah, and I'll, I'll agree. Uh, Quentin in particular really stands out to me in talking to other advocates or other patients and formulating his own plan. I feel that's really important because healthcare providers uh, are not dialysis patients. So uh, we can't uh, share that perspective of the same thoughts and fears and concerns that someone else may have. Um, so a personalized plan for yourself is always very important. We can deliver the information, but ultimately the choice is yours and understanding what something can do for you medically, but also mentally is also important. And I, I've never heard that perspective on a vascular access before, but I have had um, patients tell me that they're worried about disfigurement with dialysis. And that's a very real thing that um, can have a mental impact on someone if they have to undergo uh, hemodialysis or even have a PD catheter. But, you know, Quentin, I think that was an excellent point to bring out about having a resource team around you that can provide you with the information you need so that you can feel supported and not alone in your process as well. Right. Exactly. And I, you know, I just want to say I, I, I was ignorant to all of that, Patrick, to, to be honest. And, you know, in my um, career with um, educating CKD and in-center patients um, on home um, and messaging them, I, this is a subject that I also need to learn about because it's important in how you educate people and how you approach them and how you speak with them because I, I didn't know I've never heard of that um, but I can just try to imagine how that feels um, and what that can do to a person um, and it just shows and highlights the, the need for so much more education mm -hmm. no matter what you know, job a person does to try to understand what ESRD means and what dialysis is um, and just the ignorance that is there. Um, and it's it's a little bit heartbreaking to me to tell you the truth. Um, so I just want to say that I'm sorry that that you or anyone ha has to go through anything like that. Um, but learning about your options you know, is so important. And then having people in your community, um, and I'm sure Kimberly can talk to this, um, to just help you and to support you mm -hmm. um, and to address some of these things. And it's also another reason why the communication with your healthcare team is so important. Because if we don't know that that's going on, then I can't understand it and I can't help. Um, right. And I can't try to improve on that ignorance. Um, so thank you for sharing that very personal thing. I, I really appreciate that. And I'm sure many people on the call um, appreciate it the same and can relate. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that's that's why even as an educator and a nurse and a patient, I'm looking to learn from people every day um, because we our experiences are all very individual. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, so. We can move on to another question in the chat. Um, well, I've got a question here from Sonia. Back in the 90s, I did PD, but I got peritonitis. I received a transplant, but I have to return to dialysis now. Will I be able to do PD again? Kimberly, do you want to address that? Well, it's, I, I always say this to uh, patients. It's not a, it's not a rule out unless you know, there may not be enough information involved. It really depends on the number of infections you've had, as well as the type of infection you've had. Um, but with uh, 
similar circumstances of patients we've had, we still send them for the evaluation to see if that exists for them, you know, um, and they should have a thorough physical evaluation, exploratory, you know, um, by the surgeon who does the PD catheter to say, look, you know, we will try. And if it doesn't work, then okay, we tried, you know, to do it. Um, in a lot of circumstances, though, the number of infections cause a lot of scarring to your membrane and the return to peritoneal dialysis is not an option. But I always said to leave the door open and pursue it uh, if that's what you really want to do, because the potential could be there for you to be successful with PD again. Yeah, I, I would completely agree with, with Kimberly. Important to realize that if you've been on PD in the past and had a peritonitis infection, it doesn't mean that you can't do peritoneal dialysis in the future with the caveats that Kimberly outlined. And also, if you've had a transplant that unfortunately is now no longer working, we have many patients who thrive on PD after returning from uh, having a transplant that mm -hmm. unfortunately has, has stopped working. So both of those things are, are uh, scenarios where people can come back to PD and do quite well. I think it's also important to highlight that the peritonitis rates were quite a bit higher in the 1990s mm -hmm. than they are now in 2023. There are many centers in the United States now where we're, we're seeing peritonitis rates where the events are only one in every five patient years. So the peritonitis rates are a lot lower than where they, where they were uh, many years ago due to advances in a variety of different technologies and training techniques, et cetera, uh, that help patients to remain peritonitis free for, for longer periods. Great. Right. Yeah, good point. Um, I have another question here from um, Keisha. I've been on in-center dialysis now for over two years, and I think I'm wanting more control over my treatment and my life but I'm unsure about home hemo. So Kimberly. Okay, well, um, if, I, I feel you're very motivated at this point, which would lead me if I were in the facility to say, come on, let's go and let's just do it. Um, I think that, I think you have to experience it first. You can get the education about what the benefits are of the therapy are gonna do for you, but actually going through that process uh, is going to be the best benefit for you. So my recommendation to you would be to um, meet with the training nurse that you feel is going to pair with you the best with you, your personalities and get along. You have different options at different centers um, as well. So because they're going to be your partner for a very long period of time and be on call for you 24 hours a day. So um, it's more like a very uh, family relationship. Um, but what I'm telling you right now is that I feel that you, you're empowered and you're already activated to do this. So I would challenge you after this um, to make a phone call and jump in with both feet and go and just to go try it. Right. It can only yeah. be beneficial because if it doesn't work out and for whatever reason, which, you know, it's pretty rare. I mean, I most I think most people who are motivated do excellent at home on home hemo, but there's really no risk to you. You can always go back to in center. So um, if you are motivated to try it, I, I agree with Kimberly. Um, I think it would be um, a great, great choice for you to do. More frequent yeah, dialysis is definitely healthier. I Come would agree with York. that perspective. <laughs> Are you I in New York by any chance? I would love to see you in my life. It's interesting, um, yeah. you know, share a little bit about our program. I mean, we do uh, a lot of nocturnal dialysis, which, which is an option, so you can have your days free. Um, we uh, have also taken patients from substantial uh, distances because of what um, you're saying that you're motivated to do the therapy, but on the other hand, you can't get it where you're where, where you are. Um, we've had several patients tell us that, or they want a specific machine. Uh, we use different types of dialysis machines, and some um, one of our the outset machine is not used everywhere. So we've had people with interest in the equipment working better for them. Uh, you know, but you know, at the end of the day. Like I said, we're always available in New York. So, you know, if you're around, so you can come here. 
But um, it is really essential that you find a center that's a full service center as well. And with an, ex, you know, an experienced nephrologist in home dialysis, you know, I'm sure Graham wants you to come to his side of the world planet. And, you know, I want you to come to mine, <laughs> but move, move to California. Or you could come to mine at U.S. <laughs> Renal. <laughs> exactly. No, but yeah, not to be flippant about it, but I agree with everything that Don and Kimberly have said here. Um, and, and also realize that if you try home hemodialysis, the initial period of this will be one-on-one -on -one training with a nurse in the home center typically. And that gives you a, an opportunity to get to feel comfortable, to ask questions, to really understand what the home hemodialysis is gonna be like once you're there and you're actually hands-on with the equipment doing that, doing what essentially you will be doing in your home with someone who's teaching you how to do it. Mm -hmm. And you can feel the benefits because you will be doing as you're training the more frequent right. sessions. So at that time, you'll be able to see the difference that you feel with the more frequent dialysis. Um, Dr. Abra, I have a question for you from Ivan. Does PD preserve kidney function for a little longer than HD? That's a really que excellent question from Ivan. And yes, um, a number of studies have looked at this. And when you compare patients who start on peritoneal dialysis in comparison to those who uh, start on in-center hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis tends to preserve the remaining kidney function for longer uh, compared to in-center hemodialysis. And this, this is a benefit in a number of ways. Uh, your own kidneys do a lot more than the machine does. It's an ama they are two amazing organs in our body and they clear toxin, but they also produce hormones that allow our body to produce red blood cells. They help to mediate the balance of calcium, phosphorus, parathyroid hormone, a, a whole milieu of things that impact our bone health and calcification of blood vessels. They regulate the acid-base status of the body. They're really just amazing organs that do far more than our machines, although they're advanced. They're, they're pretty crude compared to what our bodies have evolved over many, many, many years. So uh, preserving that remaining kidney function allows us to maintain better blood pressure. It allows us to have a more liberal diet, potentially to use less medications to mediate, uh, to take care of things like anemia and uh, manage things like phosphorus and parathyroid hormone. So and I always say any, even a drop of urine is better than zero. Um, but because of right. the benefits that come with that remaining uh, kidney function. And it, and it is an important advantage of, of peritoneal dialysis. Mm -hmm. Patrick, did you maintain your urine output when you were on PD? Um, probably for the first year and a half, and then I just went complete um, stage five. So. Okay. Yeah, and, th and that, that can absolutely happen. It doesn't mean that peritoneal dialysis preserves kidney function forever, mm -hmm. um, but just mm -hmm. in comparison to in-center hemo, it keeps it around for a longer period if you know two similar people were to do the different modalities. Mm -hmm. Well, I will say um, that when I started dialysis, I was at stage five and I'm on in-center hemo and I have, you know, it's not optimal urine function, but I urinate um, pretty decently. I get a good output enough to where they were able to reduce my uh, my diuretics. Right, and that's key too. You could talk to your nephrologist about that. Well, it's a point Absolutely. to bring up if we're going to choose in center dialysis that you really don't want to go through the highs and lows of your blood pressure and crashing because it's going to impact the blood flow, not only to a kidney, but also your brain as well. So, you know, during your, if you choose in center dialysis as your, as your modality, then I think you have to have an understanding of the other controls that need to be put in place as far as, you know, what is too much during a dialysis session versus what is safer during a dialysis session for your body. And, um, you know, learning the medications, you know, you have diet restrictions and things like that. Those things all have to be very fine tuned if you choose it. But the controls over what's done during the dialysis is very important to understand if done in excess, like that it could have impact on your other organs in your body, including your heart. 
And, and you know, I'm one, very happy to hear that Quentin has has that kidney function. I'm happy to hear that yeah. the is still there. <laughs> yeah. Now, one of the things that um, I like to add that impacted me is I was that when I was diagnosed with um, end stage uh, renal disease. It wasn't until stage three B, and I was at between. Um, 30 to 35 percent kidney function. So I really think, um, you know, when they can, the quicker they can catch it also plays a part in that because I started dialysis the same year that I was actually diagnosed. So, mm -hmm. wow. Yeah, yeah I, that's a really important point, yeah. Dr. G, you know, that the earlier that we can diagnose, the earlier we can start treating and hopefully keep people off of dialysis. But if we're not able to achieve that goal, it gives us the time to do exactly what we're doing here to educate people around what their options are so they can make the best decision for them. And, you know, just this discussion, I think, is highlighting it's complicated. There's a lot yeah. to think mm -hmm. about, a lot to learn, and that takes time and usually multiple conversations and insights from different people, different experiences to really get, you know, what's going to work best for me. So I completely agree with the, the sentiment that early, early diagnosis is important. Agreed. Right. So we have a couple of questions here too about home hemo again. Uh, what are the challenges related to cannulation that are posed to patients trying to do home hemo? So yeah. um, I actually replied to that. So it, in any form, because I cannulate myself sometimes at my clinic, even though I'm not on home dialysis, the best person to know your access is you. Yeah. Whichever form of access you have, whether you have, you know, a graft or an AV fistula or, or one of those new, you know, clinical trial, uh, you know, accesses that there are more easier to uh, cannulate. Um, it also depends on where your access is. So I have mm -hmm. a left arm AV fistula in my forearm, but I've seen people with their fistulas in their upper, you know, bicep. I've seen people who have their uh, fistulas or even catheters in their groin area because their veins in Arm won't handle it. Um, so, with cannulation and the challenges, whether it's in center or at home, it's major. The, the three major things: the education they provide you upon doing home hemo, whether or not you're sticking yourself or somebody else is sticking. When you're in center, you have people called uh, expert cannulators. So, when you're working on transferring the home hemo. You want to make sure that you get an expert cannulator to show you, you know, how to stick because you can go too high and you can go too, you can go too shallow, it goes straight through the, the fish flow or the graph. Um, also, if you have somebody who's going to cannulate you and you're not going to self cannulate, you got to make sure that they're comfortable with essentially uh, causing harm. And, and when I say that, it's, it's going to hurt every new spot they stick, it will hurt because your fistula is going to be a, a decent size and they're not going to be able to hit the same spot because it causes scarring, which causes inadequate, inadequate treatment. So when you when you ever stick a new spot, you, you got to understand that that first initial stick is going to be painful. But they also have to understand that it's for your benefit. A little bit of pain for long-term success is, is you know, never wrong. Um, if Excellent. you have left and you have boreholes, I feel like a lot of people I know that have grafts, those are typically easier, but those are the ones that um, people have uh, more trouble with just because, you know, it's hard to balloon them and put a stick and things like that. And when you go to the access center, you have more problems than not. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it all depends on who's sticking you, where your access is, and the size needles you use. Mm -hmm. I think it's having someone to work with you as well when you're afraid of needles. Um, 
needle phobia is prevalent amongst a lot of people. Um, in talking to most people, uh, their experiences in the past or what they fear the most really comes out of some child-rooted behaviors after getting vaccinated as a child or having some poor experience with a healthcare experience in their past. So I think, um, you know, in that discussion, you really have to talk through, well, what is, what is the real fear? Um, you know, at times the nurses can do a tandem cannulation with you so that, you know, I'm holding your hand, you're holding the needle, we do it together. Um, you will have less, typically less pain when you, um, when you cannulate yourself. Um, we've also gone into using some, you know, just Emily cream spray and ensuring even lavender oil is something that we've used because it's been medically studied uh, to decrease cannulation pain. Uh, so we try to ensure that process as well uh, throughout, you know, teaching someone how to cannulate. But the first thing is when someone says they're afraid and I hand you the needle, go ahead and scream. <laughs> It, all of a sudden you're going to relax and you're going to focus. So um, just realize that if you you want to do self-cannulation, you can do self-cannulation. It's just the nurse is going to have to use different techniques with you. And Agreed. And I would also just point out two, two clinical points here as well. It is possible to do home hemodialysis with a catheter. You do. Um, yes. So that's an important thing to realize. If you have a catheter, you don't have to get a fistula or graft in order to begin mm -hmm. home hemodialysis training. So that's an important point to understand. Mm -hmm. And then number two, I'm sure Kimberly and, and others on the panel here can discuss, sometimes we'll use something called buttonhole, buttonhole. cannulation mm -hmm. to try to address some of the issues that come up around fear, pain, angle of cannulation, the difficulty with finding it each time mm -hmm. consistently buttonholes which are a site where you consistently cannulate through the same uh, through the same tunnel that's created initially with a sharp needle but eventually cannulated with a blunt needle is a way to address some of these issues mm -hmm. yeah perfect so here's an interesting question um, and dr. Abra this would be for you um, from Greg I have PKD. My kidneys are very large, 23 centimeters and 20 centimeters. I'm on PD now. I just started. My doctor is considering taking a kidney out to give me more room for the PD process. What are your thoughts about taking out a kidney? Just heard your comments about keeping a kidney function. So it's a tough decision. Absolutely. That's a really excellent question. And I think uh, highlights a couple important points from Greg. Um, particularly for folks who have autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, ADPKD. Um, number one, I think it's important to realize people with ADPKD can do peritoneal dialysis. Mm -hmm. uh, in the past, um, folks have talked about the difficulty with this because of potentially the size of the kidneys, uh, making it difficult to do PD. Um, but I think Greg's experience and many others, patients that I've cared for, uh, people with ADPKD can really thrive on peritoneal dialysis. So that's mm -hmm. point number one. Um, point number two, um, people with ADPKD, um, one of the extra kidney, extra renal manifestations of it, uh, are it, folks are a little bit higher risk for hernias. Um, so that's an important thing as you're beginning peritoneal dialysis and on PD, if you have ADPKD, is to regularly examine your belly um, and your groin area to make sure that you're not developing a hernia uh, uh, that might potentially need to be addressed. So that's a, a point number two important about ADPKD. Uh, in regards to uh, a native nephrectomy, taking out a kidney, um, in order to create more intra-abdominal space. That's a, that's, a, that's a personalized decision, an important one to discuss with your nephrologist to understand what is the advantage of doing this? Is it because you're having a lot of pain and discomfort with fills? Is it because you're getting recurrent cyst infections uh, and that's a major issue for you with that kidney? Is it because you're anticipating a transplant soon and the transplant surgeons need more anatomic space to place the transplanted kidney? 
all of these things are really critical to discuss and understand um, to, to get the reasoning behind why the kidney needs to come out. Um, I would make the point that just because you have large, large kidneys does not mean that the kidneys need to come out. There should be an additional clinical reason uh, behind why the, the nephrectomy needs to be done. So I can tell you, Greg, I have PKD. I also had very large kidneys, 26 centimeters a piece. Um, I was transplanted uh, with my native kidneys. And then when that kidney failed, because I did have reoccurring UTIs, kidney infections, um, they were just very troublesome during my transplant journey that before my second transplant, they, they I did have a double nephrectomy mm -hmm. um, because they felt that the infections um, actually were causing my uh, immune system to boot up reoccurrent. And so it was a slow chronic, chronic rejection over time. And my medication pretty much became obsolete. Um, so I did have both of the kidneys removed. It was a very intense uh, surgery. Um, but um, I can tell you that the minute that they were out, I felt so much better. Mm -hmm. um, it just, the feeling of it, of them being gone, um, if anyone's ever seen pictures of polycystic kidneys, um, then you would know how I was feeling. Um, but you pretty much feel pregnant with them all the time. So, and then now that I've had them out, I've had this transplant for 16 years and I'm doing very, very well. But definitely like Dr. Haber said, discuss with your <laughs> nephrologist. Don, we couldn't have planned that better. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and I was looking for everyone else's advice, not my own, but um, yeah, that's so I can relate, Greg, for sure. Okay, so let's see what else we can address here from people that are ask, asking questions. These are great questions, so keep them coming, guys, um, because it, we, we want to know what you want to know. Um, what are the benefits of using the buttonhole for self-cannulation? Mm -hmm. I, I, I can address that one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so with buttonhole, you can preserve your access longer because you're not doing the typical stick here, stick here, stick here. Stick. Or in center, you have to be very careful that someone is not putting your needles in the same spot all the time. That's one. Um, for sightliness like the look of your fistula at times um find that those fistulas may look a little healthier and not uh significant uh expansion uh vessels but you know um and then with use of the buttonhole i think what people have to understand i, I always describe it as you know when women get earrings mm -hmm. as a child you know they stuck you with a sharp needle and then now my earrings are a blunt object so you know there's no pain describe it right right and just so a feeling of pressure exactly. right it's a little bit of pressure when you put it when you put it through so uh for those who are experiencing a lot of pain during cannulation the if you have a fistula that is an option for for you to possibly try and you can do it yourself as well Okay, so another great question I want to get to because this is this this is a concern for many people that want to go on a home on home hemo, but they don't have a caregiver. So maybe Dr. Arbor knows about this. Uh, Joe Allen wants to know: Is there anything being done or looked at to get caregivers covered by insurance so mm -hmm. people can go home on home hemo? Yeah, fantastic question. Um, the first thing to realize is that you can do solo he home hemodialysis. Mm -hmm. So um, I have a number of patients, we have a number of patients treated within our dialysis provider system that, that do dialysis, mm -hmm. quote, solo. They do their own home hemodialysis. So that's, that's point number one. Uh, point number two, it's a great question about advocacy because it, our care partners are, are folks who support people on home hemo when there is someone who's assisting with it are so important. They're really, you know, they're heroes. They're people who do amazing things to support their loved ones. Um, and yes, there are advocacy efforts um, through a number of different organizations to try to get care partners funded 
uh, to provide them with financial support for the time and effort and energy they put into learning how to do home hemodialysis and then subsequently helping patients to dialyze at home. So there are uh, advocacy efforts at the federal level. I encourage you to get engaged with mm -hmm. the National Kidney Foundation, with Home Dialyzers United, with all of the uh, wonderful advocacy organizations that are out there to lobby our representatives to, to make this a reality for people uh, in the future. Um, I would also say in some states, depending on your insurance, uh, there are uh, programs available uh, to help support hours that are given towards caregiving for people on dialysis. So mm -hmm. in the place where I live in California, we have a, 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 a program called IHSS, which provides hours mm -hmm. for care partners who provide uh, uh, care partner services to patients on PD and with home hemo. Excellent. Excellent. Um, oh, here's a good one from um, Nichelle. What are some great online trainings for a caregiver to take for a loved one doing home dialysis? I think most people get the training in the clinic. Am I right, Kimberly? Yeah, I'm actually jogging through all of the resources that I know that are online. Um, so a lot of people will watch videos on YouTube to get a, a basic understanding. Um, there's also another um, thing called Kidney School, which is a modular education that um, it walks you through different aspects of dialysis to kind of do a self-learning. Uh, um, and also, but the majority of what you learn is, is done in the clinic. We do do pre-training pre and pre-learning as well. So we kind of hand you a resource list to say, uh, you know, that here's some websites that you may need to, that you may want to look at to get an idea and then we'll have a discussion, you know, about it. Um, I do telehealth education. If someone's really interested, I have the equipment behind me and we're doing learning sessions before everything actually uh, starts for both PD and HD as well. So um, uh, that that's where basically I, I would start with medical, you know, MEI, Medical Education Institute, um, home dialysis discussion group. Uh, there's lots of Facebook groups as well, mm -hmm. social media groups that you can tap into to ask questions and uh, get real responses from people who are actually uh, using home dialysis and different um, op therapies and options as well. Absolutely. Yeah. I'd, I'd highlight those, those patient adv yeah. advocacy groups, the American Kidney Fund, the American Association of Kidney Patients, yeah. Home Dialyzers United. These are all excellent resources for folks uh, in addition to everything that Kimberly mentioned. Um, I think also excitingly down the pipeline, there are dialysis providers that are experimenting with virtual mm -hmm. reality training mm -hmm. uh, for patients actually using virtual reality goggles so that you can get uh, the experience of doing home dialysis before you actually get the hands-on equipment through virtual reality formats. I think that's uh, an important thing for the, for the future to watch. Uh, but in the meantime, there's many great resources right now uh, that you can uh, take advantage of. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. And we are out of time. So thank you to our speakers for a very informative and inspiring discussion. I think it went really great. I learned a lot myself, I know. And thanks to all of you for listening, uh, for your thoughtful comments and questions in the chat. Um, I, I hope everyone got the information that they needed and wanted. So with the breakout session wrapping up, please click on the main stage, left-hand side of your screen to continue with the rest of today's programming. It will be starting momentarily on the main stage. Um, we'll hear for another great group of patient advocates and discuss the different paths that they choose when it comes to dialysis. Thank you everybody today. It was my pleasure. Thank Have you. a great Thank day you and enjoy the rest of the program. Bye.